Good morning, everyone. My name is Stuart Richner, CEO of Richner Communications and publisher of Herald Community Newspapers. This morning on Herald Inside LI, our distinguished panel will dive into the latest federal COVID relief package and discuss how its programs can help you and your business. Joining us this morning to answer all of your questions are Jessica Dennehy, Robert Pihota, Lou Pizzoleo, and Robert Toby. Thank you all for being here today. Also, thank you to our sponsor, Rossi Advisors and Accountants, for supporting this episode of Herald Inside LI. I know that we are all looking forward to hearing more about this long overdue relief. So we'll get right to it with Sky Ostriker, Herald Inside LI's host, leading today's discussion. Sky, over to you. Thank you, Stuart, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Herald Inside LI. I'm your host, Sky. Happy New Year. Herald Inside LI is a weekly webinar series brought to you by Herald Community Newspapers and Richner Live Events, a media group based in Nassau County. Our slogan is real local, real news, and that's what we're bringing you today. While this morning's webinar on new COVID-19 relief programs for small businesses is directly tied to lawmaking in Washington, we will not get political on this panel. Instead, we'll bring you a discussion focused on tangible takeaways, solutions, programs, ideas, and ways to ameliorate the stresses of everyday Long Island business owners when it comes to all the paperwork, planning, taxes, and loans associated with owning a business during a pandemic. Today's webinar is sponsored by Grazi Advisors and Accountants, and we're fortunate to have two CPAs on this panel who will help break down all the complicated information out there into bite-sized digestible pieces so we can all understand exactly what to do, when to do it, and how. My role on this panel is to moderate with the perspective of my audience in mind, you, Long Islanders. I've received more than a dozen questions for our panelists, and since I'm not a finance person, I can assure you that I will ensure the ways in which our panelists answer the questions is truly elementary. So audience, don't be bashful when, when submitting your questions. Please use that Q&A function on the bottom of the screen to type them in, type in your questions, and I'll pose them to the panel throughout our discussion. As I mentioned, I'm joined by two CPAs and partners from Grazi Advisors and Accountants, Robert Toby and Lou Kizaleo. In addition to Robert Pihota, the Long Island branch manager for the United States Small Business Administration's New York District Office, who told me he gets 30 phone calls per day from Long Islanders who are overwhelmed with paperwork and decisions to be made about their businesses. Which brings us to our fourth panelist, Jessica Dennehy, who's a lawyer by trade, and during the last few months of this pandemic we're in, developed a business whereby she consults with other businesses to help them pivot if they're stuck in crisis mode, as so many businesses are, and slay, aka seize the day and make the best of the circumstances we're faced with. As we all know too well, the COVID pandemic has impacted everyone, every industry, every family, child, person, the whole thing is overwhelming. And although we're going on 10 months of the pandemic, everyone's still adjusting and dealing with the repercussions and ramifications. Anyway, panelists, thanks for taking the time out of your busy mornings to spend the next hour with the Herald and me on Inside LI. If you could kindly smile so I can take a screenshot selfie of the screen, and this image will be used in an upcoming article that recaps today's discussion. Great. <laughs> and this show is also being recorded. So anyone who missed it, there'll be an article recapping the discussion as well as the recording on our website along with all our past episodes of Herald Inside LI, uh, www.liherald.com slash inside LI. So let's get down to business. I'd like to ask Robert Pihota, the Long Island branch office manager of the US Small Business Administration's New York District Office, who by the way, I called the office number myself as an outsider to get a hold of someone to be a panelist on this webinar. And Rob himself called me back on my cell phone at 8.30 a.m. the next day. So despite all his busyness, that's the type of government response people need and deserve. So Rob, thank you. Thanks for being here. And let's kick it off from your perspective. How does this PPP program work? And what does the second round mean for business? 
And then we'll dive in with our tax experts and strategists here for a candid and open conversation, which is how the Herald likes to orchestrate these panels. So feel free to chime into each other's remarks and, and we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, Sky, and, and, and thank you, Long Island Herald and the Stewart. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Rob Pihota, and I, I am the branch office manager for the SBA here on Long Island, the Long Island branch office located in Hopog. So couldn't be more thrilled and honored to be here speaking to the folks uh, that are tuning in. You know, this is a unprecedented times. So I don't have to tell you that. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's been challenging for going on a year now. And uh, the PPP program is really the hallmark of a government response that is in itself unprecedented. Um, for those who have not heard this, normally the SBA, it's rare the SBA makes loans themselves uh, because they normally, the lenders make the loans and the SBA guarantees the loans. But this, when there's an emergency, as declared by the president, uh, the SBA comes to the aid when there's a hurricane or a tornado and you've heard of several states, you've been part of responses where your area might have been declared a disaster area and the SBA made loans, uh, Superstorm Sandy, Katrina, et cetera. Well, this is the first time ever in the history that they've had all 50 states declare disaster at the same time. So the, the response has been rather deliberate and, and methodical uh, because it's never happened before. This, that's not to make excuses, that's to give you a little bit of context there's a number of folks on here that probably are, you know, can't get the capital that's needed fast enough, whether it be through the PPP program or the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. I, I really want to make a little bit of a point here before I get into the PPP specifics. And I'm not going to take a lot of time because the questions are probably more, more important than anything I will say. But I'd like to point out that for, for Long Island, specifically, there's been over almost 6,500 PPP, I'm sorry, 65,000 PPP loans that have been rendered so far. So the magnitude is amazing. That's just Long Island alone. By the way, Long Island uh, demographic as a business entity is larger than most SBA districts across the country. That shows the power, scope and magnitude we have here on Long Island. Um, for the benefit of all, we have some tremendous panelists on here and you'd be, You'd be silly not to utilize their expertise when the time comes. You also have SBA resource partners at your disposal. And I think the best pearl I can give you in preparation for submitting your PPP loan request, if that's how you're so predisposed, and that is you need to look at the sba.gov website. There is a number of resource partners you can get free assistance from, not only in advice on how to start a business, grow a business, expand a business, but how to recover in your business, which is where we're talking right now. Uh, for instance, small business development centers. Here on Long Island, there are two. There's one in Farmingdale, State University of New York, and there's one at Stony Brook. Small business development center. If you just Google SBDC, you'll find something. And they're all virtual. So wherever you are, you can contact them virtually. And the reason why I promote them so heavily, and that's because they can help you answer a lot of the questions we're gonna to be touching on right now. Some things I'll be talking about or not talking about will be clarified as each day goes by and you can probably get up to the minute uh, information from the SBDCs. Basic stuff, how to, what, what documentation to accumulate, uh, what, also what other programs might be available at a state level or a county level, maybe even grants, things that I really can't address because I'm a federal person. So I just recommend make a relationship with your SBDC or SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, uh, Service Corps of Retired Executives. They are a bunch of great professionals who have walked your walk, started a business, grown, expanded, and recovered from a disaster or two. And they can help you go through some of the key decision uh, processes you need to go through in order to prepare for and execute what you need to do moving forward. I heard the word pivot earlier from Sky, and everybody is doing the pivot dance these days. How do you take one business, pivot a little bit to address some of the needs and concerns? So I highly recommend you look into the, uh, the resource partner uh, armamentarium we have for you to utilize. Plus, again, the professionals in trade, CPAs, attorneys, 
that you're going to probably need at some point in time. That's just a, that's a that's a best practice. So having said that, the PPP, I, I really want to point out, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. It's designed to restore payroll to your employees over the course of the CARES Act and now the Economic Aid Act that was recently passed into law, which is still being refined as we speak. But it's, it's designed to help you restore payroll to your employees or to yourself if you are in fact an employee of your own company, as well as covered some key covered expenses. Uh, there's been some changes and now we know that six, at least 60% of your PPP must go towards payroll. As much as 40% may go to authorized covered expenses. The new Economic Aid Act does allow for a number of different kinds of entities to qualify for PPP, uh, as well as some additional expenses that had not been covered before on the old act. So are those are some key areas. And again, if you're thinking, well, I wonder if it applies to me, we're going to cover some of the areas today through the questions and answers. But again, some things won't be answered and some things cannot be answered today. Uh, so the benefit of me being here is to give you a little bit of insight into what help can be made available, but also uh, some of the questions I won't be able to answer. I'm going to take back and try to get a quicker response to some of the, uh, the, the things that are, that are on your mind. I do want to mention right now, and I'll wrap up in a second, the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. This is about PPP today, but the EIDL, if you have an idle or you haven't uh, gone requested an idle, which is designed for working capital of different types. I recommend you go to sba.gov and find out what you need to do to apply. The idle loan is a direct loan right from the SBA. Uh, the change that the Economic uh, Aid Act gave us is now you can now go back in and apply for an EIDL even if you did not re request one in the past. The, the, the deadline was the end of the year in 2019, you can now apply for an EIDL. That is a direct loan from the SBA, 30 year term. If you're a for-profit organization, the uh, interest rate is 3.75. If you're a nonprofit, it's 2.75. It is a term loan. So if critical working capital is on your uh, wish list for 2021, I recommend you look at that. Uh, Okay. I'll, stop, I'll stop here. I'll, I'll pass the time back to Sky. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. And like I said, I'd like to keep this conversation candid and, and conversational. And there's a lot of things you mentioned there, Rob, which I want to dial back into, like those EIDL and the advance and if it's deducted from the PPPs. But we'll get into the nitty gritty. And, and you mentioned the resources that are available in visiting the SBA website and turning to these small business hotspots, what, what did you call them at Farmingdale and Stony Brook, they're small business development centers, that's what you called them, but I want to really open up the conversation with our experts here, the tax experts and, and Jessica, business strategists who specializes in this pivot and slay that you mentioned, Rob, um, but let's, let's really open it up now to Robert and Lou from the tax perspective and talk about some of the things that your clients are asking you and, and when should someone call their accountant? instead of visiting a website because a lot of people like to talk to a person instead of you know do all the research and drive themselves nuts sure. uh, yeah that's that's yeah good morning and i'm robert toby i'm a cpa at, at Grassi and company um first of all I, I wish you all a happy new year and continued good health throughout uh, the remainder of this pandemic um when you should call us is when you believe you need to work through a calculation to uh, maximize your loan to figure out what, and I'm going to get to this, what, what, how you qualify for the employee retention credit or how you calculate and maximize the loan forgiveness. These are three specific parts, uh, two, re, two with respect to the um, uh, payroll protection loans and the other with respect to uh, employment tax credits that are available to you uh, that were available before for non payroll protection loan borrowers, but after the enactment of the most recent um, relief legislation, uh, they are now of, um, available to folks who got payroll protection loans. So I'm gonna cover the, the em employee retention credit first. And these are credits, these are payroll tax credits. They're, they're, you can offset an employer's portion of, of 
payroll tax expenses. So it's uh, payroll tax payments. So it's real money. It covers social security taxes. Um, the rules that were in effect for 2020 uh, were the maximum credit was $5,000 um, per employee uh, for the entire year. Um, you can, you, there were cutoff rules with respect to um, employers above 100 employees and employers over 100 employees. Um, the rules, uh, you had to have a, for employers over 500 or 100 employees, you had to have a 50% reduction in revenue or you had to have a, a partial or total uh, disruption of your business due to COVID-19. It's interesting what partial disruption is. It can fit very easily, and, and it's uh, a definition that's that's fairly soft within the law that, do, that doesn't contemplate certain businesses. But I'll give you an example of one that, that we faced where we had a uh, home health care agency that had one division that um, had, had um, in-home nursing aides that in one other division they had uh, trainers and because the nursing aides couldn't go down couldn't go and just visit their clients because of covid uh their trainers were laid off so we determined and they they qualified for the employee retention credit based on being partially struck down it's a very flexible program it puts real money in your pocket today so it's a quick way to recover some cash um uh, that you can you know you can use to run your business to keep in your pocket to, to, to run your business the program for the the employee retention credit has gotten richer in for 2021 it runs for the first two quarters of 2021 uh it's now the cutoff is 500 employees uh instead of a, a 50 percent uh reduction in revenue um you only have to have a, a, a smaller uh, reduction of revenue and it's uh, a total of seven thousand dollars per employee per quarter. So it's it's a lot richer. And Rob, the other big part. Sorry to jump in. If if I could just follow on. So previously, the employee retention tax credit you you couldn't use if you were a PPP recipient right. prior to the new law that was passed at the end of December. So you may have looked at this and dismissed it last year. Um, under the new law, you can now go relook at it for 2020 and retroactively file for that credit in 2020. Yeah. So this is real cash right now, which you may have dismissed already. The, this, the other, the other thing that expanded yeah. it for 2021. Go ahead, Rob, sorry. No, so the other, the other thing is that you, you can't double dip with respect to this. Uh, you can't use the employee retention credit uh, wages that were, were paid with payroll protection loan proceeds. You can't double dip. However, there are certain types of wages that didn't qualify uh, like owner's wages over a certain amount and um, it, it, there, you know, it, and, and uh, other certain types of wages that were paid. Now you can go back and, and claim the employee retention credit on certain types of wages. So there's an interplay between the employee retention credit and the payroll protection loan and which, which um, wages you claim for forgiveness in the payroll protection uh, loan forgiveness process. So that's, that's where we come in to help do these calculations so you can maximize A, forgiveness to make sure 100% of your loans forgiven and two, to make sure you get the highest amount of the employee retention credit. It's a really cool program. Uh, we are we at Grassi are currently working on our, our, our product offering for this. You'll be hearing more about us uh, uh, for this. And, and this is something that a lot of folks really on a, uh, haven't focused on. We've picked up on this. We believe that a lot of, of clients, a lot of businesses will be able to really benefit in 2020 and get money retrospectively. I mean, how often does the government allow you to get money, you know, back retrospectively that you've already paid? Not a bad deal. The other uh, thing that came, uh, that was a real big thing in, in the new relief act was the deductibility of uh, expenses paid with um, payroll protection loan funds. Uh, the IRS back in May um, ruled that those weren't going to be expenses. A lot of us spent time fight, uh, writing and thinking uh, about how we could still work around this, uh, given the uncertainty about lo uh, loan forgiveness for certain people. Well, it's clear. You can deduct 
the expenses that you incurred in 2020 and were funded with payroll protection loan funds on your 2020 tax return. This might cause a dilemma for partnerships and S-corporations in particular because of the way that they might incur a loss uh, with respect to these expenses in, in um, 2020, but have their loan forgiven in 2021 and get basis for that loan. Uh, and there might be a mismatch in, in, in the timing of, the, of really when you're going to get those deductions flowing through to your personal tax return. I know that the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants is working on this with the IRS to try to get the two matching. I was on a phone call yesterday um, uh, where uh, our, our head lobbyist was, was talking about their, their meeting with the IRS to, to push them today to have... Um, to eliminate this mismatch. Uh, we will be publishing information about this um, when it comes out. We hope that there is not this mismatch going forward, but you still can't beat the deal. Um, yeah, these, these expenses are being deductible, are, are allowed to be deductible. This really would have had an effect on amount of money that people had to pay uh, when I'm thinking of flow through in individuals, individuals would have had to pay in, in April for, for their annual income tax and C corporations uh, for what they paid in income tax. So that was a real win for, uh, for us practitioners in industry that really pushed very hard to have that added into the law. Um, Steve Mnuchin, up until the end, kicked and scratched and, and, you know, and pounded his fist on the desk that this wasn't going to happen, but thank God we prevailed. So those are the big tax things, uh, the, the tax provisions right now. Um, yeah, happy to answer questions, happy to answer questions you know, uh, uh, offline about this. You can contact me. I think our, our contact information will be up. I love to talk about this, <laughs> these provisions. Yes, you but, love talking about it. I do. Listen, something, something I want to say is that the folks at Grafty, yes, at the end of this webinar, I'm going to put up a slide with a phone number and an email address for anyone that has questions for the folks at Grafty. So I do want to say that. And I want to circle back to what you said. We're talking about businesses with employees. And I want to ask Jessica, because you mentioned right before we got on this webinar about what about a sole practitioner and someone who doesn't have employees, how that person can still qualify for some of these loans. So. Let's turn it over to, to Jessica. Actually, it was Robert that mentioned that before. Okay. But That's okay. So, you know, so I'm going to, so, so Lou, I'm going to, so Lou and I are going to have a dialogue about this. So Lou's going to take this away and we're going to talk about loan eligibility under payroll protection uh, round one, round two, what the changes are and how you can take advantage of this stuff. Yeah. So uh, Rob Pahoda said it uh, best earlier, you know, this is the biggest stimulus package since the New Deal, uh, you know, in, in the 20s and 30s. There's, there's lots in this. Uh, everybody wants to talk about PPP and, and it's, it's it, for, for all its uh, drama in the rollout, it's been a great program that saved many, many businesses, many, many jobs. And I assume it will continue to do that in this round too. Yeah, to add a little sunshine before you talk, I wanna tell people, cause the number one thing that I got was the very first round early, early on people had applied and then everything was kind of still evolving. And so people were panicking. Am I going to get forgiven? Am I going to use the loans correctly? Am I going to end up with a loan instead of a forgiven amount? And how is that going to affect me if my business doesn't open? We didn't know at that point, right, when people were going to reopen. So for all those people, I want to tell you that as a small business owner, I went through this firsthand and I worked with Chase, that's who my loan was through, and they were amazing, and I got my entire PPP forgiven. And I was one of the people that was panicking at first because when I took the loan, the terms and, and the restrictions were different. And as they evolved, I have to say, the SBA worked really hard to incorporate the things that small business owners were worried about and ease the burden on the small business owner so that these loans could be forgiven. And uh, a lot of them have been, a lot of my clients have gotten them forgiven relatively easily. So I don't want people to panic. I know it's a lot of information. Robert and Lou and um, other Robert have all given us. They're great. And just as you listen, really take a step back and just try um, to take a lot of good notes because you're going to get through this and it's going to be great. And I'm sure that they're rectifying a lot in the second round. So I just wanted to say that before Lou gets into it because it's heavy. 
and you know people are worried and they're worried about a second shutdown so i just wanted to interject that little sunshine for a second yeah oh sure look and and it, it has there there has been more clarity as time goes on we've gotten closer and closer to the legislative intent you know the the tax deductibility issue that rob talked about just earlier you know that adds roughly 30 percent of of real value, real cash to a PPP loan, um, which went back and forth all through last year. Um, so it, 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 the relief continues to come, which is great. Um, you know, there's there's other things in this bill. Um, Rob talked about the employee retention tax credit. There's some specific relief for shuttered venue operators. You know, Broadway movie theaters, um, concert halls. That is separate from PPP. Um, so, you know, you had asked um, Sky when we first opened up when to talk to your advisors. This bill is so complex. Um, there's so much in it. And the CARES Act was as well. Uh, I would say early and often, you know, and whether that's us or some other advisor or your attorney or your mother-in-law, whoever it is, you, you know, as a business owner, you should be talking to your team, uh, people inside and extended to make sure you take advantage of all that's available. Rob mentioned, uh, Pahoder mentioned, you know, our states, our counties also have programs and he's absolutely right. Um, they're generally smaller than the PPP program, but there's lots of loans available for Main Street um, in addition to EIDL and PPP that have come in from the states or specific organizations uh, or counties or even more local governments. So uh, it's important you know, and as a business owner, it is overwhelming. You know, you're trying to run your business in crisis mode. Um, you know, finance and 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 things of this nature are not your your daily uh, full time job. It's not probably your skill set. So it's important to pull in your team and, and take advantage of of every opportunity that's there for you. One of the questions asked about a business versus a nonprofit organization and how the two can benefit from this in in different ways. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. So nonprofits are specifically included in the PPP. Um, you know, the, the SBA in prior 7A lending, um, you know, not-for-profits generally weren't included. Um, the CARES Act and PPP specifically included them. And uh, in the revisions to PPP, even further expanded that to certain other nonprofits that were excluded previously. And you mentioned the CARES Act. How does that differ from the other programs that we're talking about here? Someone asked, how does the CARES Act benefit your average Long Islander? Sure. So the CARES Act was what gave us the initial funding for the economic injury disaster loans that Rob Pihota spoke about before. Um, it was a tremendous amount of funding, actually two rounds under the CARES Act. Um, and those loans are different than PPP in that they're direct from the SBA and they're traditionally underwritten. And uh, there's you know, up to 150,000 available in, in, those, in those loans and the terms are generally better than a commercial loan. Uh, and there's a very long amortization, 30 years is a long time. Uh, so the, the CARES Act brought us the initial funding there. It brought us PPP and has kept Rob, myself, and a bunch of other people in our business extremely busy. It's been the full employment act for accountants and attorneys. And uh, I think has brought a much needed relief, uh, albeit, like I said, there was a bit, a bit of drama in the rollout. And I think anybody that's been following along would, would agree. And, you know, Rob brought up this, um, uh, metaphor earlier that we've all been using. It's like we've been flying the plane while building an engine for the plane. So uh, it was very much like that. But where we sit today, um, for me, is refreshing because I think we're as close to the legislative intent uh, in the way this program was delivered uh, as we can be. It took a while to get here, but that's where we are. So that's good. So I that's agree. Yeah, I agree with you. And for small business owners like me, I mean, I took advantage of both types of loans, guys. They're great. Okay, the the economic injury disaster loans, I they were very easy to apply for. The terms are very generous. If you took under a certain amount at the time I took it, it was under two hundred thousand dollars. You didn't have to personally secure it. That's huge. That means, God forbid, you lose your business. And I hope that doesn't happen to anyone. Um, but if you do, you don't have to like take a mortgage out on your house to pay this loan. 
the loan was secured by your business assets only. That is tremendous, guys. And also the loan, I got it at, at three point something percent. So low, over 30 years. I mean, these payments will be doable for a business, even if you struggled in 2020, if you survived and you're on your way back to normal, these loans will help you. And I saw a question about... Um, grant versus a loan. And I want to bring this up to uh, Robert Pachota because I've been getting this question a lot. What happens is you have an I, um, EIDL loan advance, which was $1,000 per employee. We were told those were going to be grants, right? If you got a PPP loan on top of that, what Chase did, right, was deduct the loan forgiveness amount by the amount of the advance. Okay, so now, but now I see my balance as, you know, let's say $5,000. So my forgiveness, I was forgiven, but now there's a $5,000 balance. How does, how do people, can you explain it in more layman's terms for everybody so they can understand why it was called a grant and a forgivable advance, and now it's been deducted from their PPP forgiveness? So Jessica, I'll I'll jump in unless Rob wants to address it because that was changed now. Uh, okay. So in, in in the new law in the uh, 2021 Appropriation Consolidated Appropriations Act, they changed that. So the EIDL advance, which was up to ten thousand um, dollars, originally was deducted from your PPP loan forgiveness under the CARES Act. In the Appropriations Act, changed that. So that is no longer deducted from your forgiveness. What's interesting is the law was um, mentioned that it would be prospective for those that didn't file for forgiveness. However, the rules that came out are explicit in that it's retroactive as well. Awesome. So See, that's a, a real show of faith there for people. I want to show the business owners like they're working towards bridging the gap between all of the stuff they tried to roll out to help us in the immediate um, you know, mess of April and March. Now they're rectifying those things that were kind of holes in the in the plan and I think business owners need to know that because they're they can't be afraid to go apply for these loans they're going to help I can volunteer here for a second uh, you know, it's forms like this that are so powerful because we do take the message back when there's a, an, up, an outcry if you will or great questions as well as your stakeholders your elected officials uh, I can't speak enough about the leadership on Long Island, because they, they had a lot of these forums and they brought these kinds of disconnects back to, to Congress. And, and this new act that has been recently released has really modified and improved to, to lose point. The EIDL advance, it was never a grant. It is It was an advance, but it's a quasi grant. And now to lose point, if, if by chance that was deducted out of your account or it was deducted from your forgiveness, there is a mechanism in place now where the SBA will uh, rectify that. But you, you got to stay on top of it. Don't assume it's going to going to happen unless you may you, you put forward the uh, the emails. Now, what about someone who has yet to apply for anything, and that now we're going to enter phase two of of this rollout? What about someone who hasn't been involved in the process? They should do what first, and and what do they need to apply for some of these loans? So if you if you qualified for PPP round one in the past, but but haven't taken it for whatever reason or took it and returned it um, for whatever reason, the, the program is reopening uh, under the new act and the new set of rules. Uh, and it's opening in this expanded fashion where there are more expenses that qualify. Um, and there's a, um, you know, the, the SBA continues to focus on Main Street and the smallest of the small and prioritize that because I, I think there was an outcry. Um, they've made it um, easier for those that have loan sizes under 150,000 uh, to receive forgiveness. Essentially, it's a, a self-certification process at this point. It's still being developed. We, we haven't seen the final uh, revised application, but for those borrowers, the smaller borrowers, the program continues to get easier and achieving forgiveness continues to get easier, which is a good thing. Um, so if you haven't yet applied for PPP1 and you do qualify or you did qualify, you, you can go back and, and, and get funds under that program. In order to qualify for what's called the second draw loan, uh, which is the new PPP loan, you have to have had a PPP1 loan and used your proceeds. 
Um, so that's what's available in PPP. The idle loans are a great program as well. Um, again, you know, we mentioned those are reopened, they're refunded, uh, and you know, encourage those to, to, to be used as well. Again, the idle is a loan, it's not a grant. So obviously um, the grant's richer than the loan. Uh, you can also do both. Um, in addition to those, there's the tax credits that we spoke about. Um, so there's, there's plenty of relief out there. If you're taking or attempting to take a second round of PPP, does your first round have to already be forgiven? It does not have to be forgiven. Uh, it does have to be used. Okay. And, and it, has there is, by, it has to be used by the date of disbursement of the of this, this the second round. The other other one other interesting point that came out that was clarified in the rules that that, that I was really thankful to see clarified is a business that is that is not open right now, but plans to reopen in the future, qualifies for a payroll protection loan. Businesses aren't, that aren't shut down don't qualify, but if you are temporarily shut down, you still do qualify for a payroll protection loan. I, I, it was one of those, you know, it, it seemed intuitive, but I was really happy to see that that was totally clarified in the rules this time. So if you were, you know, if you're, if you're temporarily shut down and you're wondering how you're going to make it, you know, to make it to getting open again, consider applying and you got to pay a you know, payroll protection loan, uh, PPP one loan, consider reapplying for a PPP, you know, second round loan. I was going to say second round loan. So you can apply for a second round. You have to use the money from the first round first. Correct. Okay. And you mentioned a business that was temporarily closed. What about if a business did decide to shutter its doors permanently, can they still apply for some of this money and retroactively pay their employees? Oof, the only thing I think that you'd qualify for is be if you had payroll during those periods and you qualified would be the, the uh, employee retention credit. I can't see where you would be able to, uh, you can't clearly apply for a payroll protection loan. Um, uh, Robert P., I mean, is, it, is there some way that they, you know, they could get an EIDL or any other type of relief at that point? If, if you're not in business, you uh, must be a viable business to qualify for either loan program. These, I don't want to get too technical, but these, both these programs, EIDL and PPP are modified 7A loans. And, and these loans are grant or given to viable businesses. So if you've closed your doors uh, permanently, the likelihood of getting a loan is very remote. I have a question on behalf of business owners, right? So for the second round of PPP, is it the same two, two and a half times your payroll? Um, and how long will you, will you still have 24 weeks to spend the money? Is, are those things similar to the first round? So what's great about round two is it's, it's very simple to apply if you've previously applied for round one. Uh, it, the baseline is, like you said, two and a half times your average monthly payroll. You can look to 2019 payroll, 2020 payroll, or the last 12 months from your application date. Most folks are gonna default to 2019 because you've already supplied the lender with support for that calculation. Um, the only nuance between round one and round two, or there's two, I should say, is in round one, the upper limit was 10 million. In round two, the upper limit is 2 million. And that was the intent there was to get more loans to more people uh, and more support to more people. So the, the overall amount uh, was lowered. Um, for certain sectors of the industry, those hardest hit, um, with an NICS code of 72, and those are restaurants and hospitality entities, the, there is an increase in the multiple to three and a half. Uh, there's still a $2 million cap on it, um, but there is an increase. That's great. The other thing that's a bit of a nuance that I should say, um, there's been a lot of talk about the affiliation rules. Um, if you own more than one business, um, you're limited to two loans in total. So the total you could get to would be $4 million in the second round, the total you can get to in the first round was 20 million. So can you clarify that? Because there are a lot of businesses, let's say you have a business with two separate locations and those are two separate corporate entities, but the owners are the same. Would you be so prohibited then from taking a loan? 
in this uh, NICS uh, class 72 restaurants and hospitality entities, it is a per location uh, type of calculation. So you're looking at, you know, 300 employees or less per location. Uh, but again, you can only you can only get a maximum of up to four million in proceeds under a, under a group. And again, that's to protect and make sure this goes to, you know, provide support for a, a larger group of uh, borrowers. Hey, and Robert P., you know, one thing that I understood about the legislation is your round one loan plus your round two loan could not exceed $10 million. I didn't see that in the legislation. Is that true? You're on mute. You're on mute, Robert. I swore I wouldn't do that. Gosh. Uh, that is my understanding, uh, but but again, it's it's one of those fuzzy areas where I I'm, I'm waiting to see clarification on that, Max. I am too, but that's what I heard. You know, that's what that's right now. Lou and I are working with that presumption. And 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 I think somebody brought up earlier. Really, this there's a, there's a major priority being placed on some of the smaller small businesses. So clearly, uh, and I think Lou, you kind of touched on it. Uh, we're trying to preserve these assets to go as far as possible to help the greatest number of people possible. Not to say that a, a large, small business is not going to benefit from it, but I think some of those details are, are yet to be ironed out. Fair enough. Another question that came and asked about a new business that opened in 2020 and can they, how can they apply for PPP? So you have to have existed prior to February 15th of 2020, but if you did, there are provisions for businesses that, you know, started between January and February 15th. Okay. It, it, this is another question for Robert Pete. So, so what was the thought about not helping businesses that, that opened later in the year, later during 2020? I mean, there was a cutoff date of, of, of the 15th. It just, it, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for equity here and, and, and I can't find it. Uh, Rob, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, what the intent was and, and the reasoning was, I, I really cannot, I cannot comment on. Uh, so that remains uh, unanswered for right now. I, I really can't tell you why the, the, the marker fell there. Yeah, I, I may be guessing, but I, I think it was because there's some, you know, whenever you have an incentive like this, you have a lot of ill actors. And I think what they were trying to prevent is people sort of creating businesses for the purposes of receiving PPP. And, you know, if you read the news, you've seen some uh, unfortunate, um, you know, actors and, and they've you know, been prosecuted and we'll probably continue, continue to see that um, because of the monumental size of the stimulus, you know, bad actors might, might try to take advantage of it. I think yeah. and I got. It was interesting to see one other, you're talking about bad actors. It was interesting to see in the rules now that if an owner or a, an officer or a shareholder of a business um, causes PPP funds to be misspent, they could be personally liable for that. I found that interesting. Yeah, that's, I think that's a good rule, but mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. Um, I saw someone was asking me if I've applied for PPP round two through Chase. It's not available to apply for yet. So no, I haven't. And we were talking a little bit offline about when it will be and the date's still uncertain. So you have to stay tuned and um, keep an ear out for that. Yeah, what you should do though, as a business owner, um, because so, and I don't know how much we talked about it, but part of the qualification for the second draw is you have to have uh, sustained a 25% reduction in revenue. Um, so as a, as a business owner that um, is looking at round two, you should start to accumulate your records uh, to be able to substantiate that reduction in revenue. Now, it's a quarter over quarter test. So any quarter in 2020 compared to any quarter in 2019. However, the rules also say um, if you show it annually, 2020 to 2019, you'll also qualify. So what you should be doing right now is talking to your advisors, reaching out to your banker, um, making sure that your um, ID and password for the portal is uh, that you use for PPP round one is handy uh, and accumulate how you're going to substantiate that reduction in revenue. The one thing to note is if your loan size is less than 150,000, you won't have to provide evidence of the reduction in revenue upon your application 
but you will be called to provide evidence uh, of that when you file for forgiveness. So you have a little more time if you want what to. What evidence are they looking for? Will it be tax filings or will it be a PL certified by your accountant? So there's, sorry, go ahead, Rob. It depends. I mean, there, there are specific, so the SBA has specific rules about how to measure gross receipts and, and they are included in the, in, in the, the, the most recent rule, IFRs. So you know, it depends on the type of business. If you're the smaller the business, then, you know, they can actually go down to bankruptcy. That's my understanding, Robert, is, is you know, if you're a real small business, they're gonna look at, at, at those. If you're a larger business, you're gonna wanna look at your tax returns because specifically the rule states for measuring gross receipts as reported on your tax return. So it depends on the size of the business. The rules do leave room for the bankers to uh, use judgment, and they also encourage the bankers to work with the borrower uh, to be able to substantiate that. A few I, think the, I think one of the questions that was asked was, do I have to go to my, if I'm, if I'm going to the second draw, must I go back to the same lender that I used for the first draw? And, and the answer uh, is no. You, you can go pretty much to any lender that is lending, and that may change from first draw to second. Uh, there is a resource on the SBA.gov website. It's called Lender Match. You can borrow from somebody across the street or across the country, as long as they are authorized by the SBA to lend. Um, that's a resource for you. A lot of, during the first round, a lot of banks would only allow you to apply if you were already a customer. Is that something that the SBA allows each bank to decide for itself? Or did the SBA tell all banks to be open to customers that are not currently with them? Thank you for the question. And the SBA cannot tell a lender what to do, who to lend money to. It's, a, it's up to them. Uh, they are SBA authorized lenders. So the challenge was early on where, in all fairness, some of the lenders were not really clear on the rules uh, and what might become the rules. So they probably shied away from unknown borrowers, but uh, the, the field is much more robust now. There's going to be times when some, some borrowers might not be able to uh, borrow from the intended lender, and, and in which case, I, I recommend you, you search elsewhere. But if it were me, I would try to go local because you, somebody there you know, but you're not limited to that by any means. Yeah, Someone also um, asked if any idle advances are, are, is that over? Someone asked the question, is it, can you still apply for that? I think the answer is no, is that correct? That's correct. And so I wanna go back to, to using your lenders again, because one of the measurement periods for the amount of the second round loan is based upon information you submitted for the first round loan. And there's an incentive to going back to your lender because you're not going to have to necessarily provide the information they already have. They can base their decision on information you've already provided. Yeah. The, the point is there, it's going to A, cost, it cost you less time and money, and B, it may speed up your getting, getting the loan approved. Definitely. So there were a few questions about specifically the SBA 7A loan relief. Can you talk specifically about that? That's a, that's a good point, and it's something that we haven't focused on um, if you had an existing 7A loan prior to these, um, these uh, laws that were put into place, both the CARES Act and uh, the 2021 Appropriations Act, the SBA is actually picking up your payments uh, for a period of time. Uh, and, and Rob P., maybe you can comment as to how long, because I haven't looked at them in a, in a couple of days and all the specific length of time, but I know the SBA is basically paying your loan for you for a period of time. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And uh, I, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to double check. I want to say six months, but I need to find out how long they will maintain that payment. But that's, that is a, an extra benefit of this particular act that uh, reinstitute that, that payment by the SBA for some a holders. And to reiterate, someone asked about the deadline to apply for the new PPP loans. I think that's something that we touched upon earlier, that that deadline is still up in the air. Is that correct? As written now, it's, it's March 31st of this year. Okay, there you go. I wanted, I wanted to address one of the questions too. Um, someone's asking, if you get both PPP loans, isn't this double dipping? I think what people might not understand is uh, a lot of the loans that were given first round, companies got when they were still shut down. So that was really to pay for their employees while their business wasn't even operational. That was really difficult on a lot of small businesses, especially in Long Island. 
So they were essentially paying people who were not working. And once they reopened, they didn't get the same flow back or groove back to their business. So they've been still struggling um, to kind of get back into uh, the black, if you will. And I don't feel, my opinion is, no, this is not double dipping. What this is doing is saying to those businesses, you're still struggling. You're still under 25% of what you normally do. You know, you still, you got 25% less than last year. You still want to keep your payroll and you still want to keep people employed. Awesome. We're going to help you do that by giving you this loan. And that way you can keep paying your employees until you get back on your feet. So to me, that is not double dipping. It's actually just helping fuel the local economy. Yeah, no, no different than the, you know, additional personal stimulus payments. Uh, this is, you know, when they, when they sat down and authored the CARES Act, I, I think, and you, you know, you can read between the lines, they have this magic date of June 30th. I think we all thought this would be over by June 30th of last year. You know, if you looked at it in January and February when the CARES Act was written, uh, nobody could have ever anticipated that this would continue on as long as it did and, and is. Uh, and that continued uncertainty is what caused these additional stimuluses. So certainly not a double dick, just continued government support. Um, you know, we said we're not going to get political, but not sure how long we can continue to print money. But that's a different answer for a different day. Yeah, and, and I'm going to tell you that I think that we'll be back talking about payroll protection round three and four at some point this year, because frankly, you know, I don't see us economically recovering until sometime in the third quarter. And if we want to maintain our economic base, it is a lot less expensive under the you know, current, I'm not trying not to, you know, under current fiscal policy to borrow at like zero interest rate for the government and get it out to businesses to keep them going, then borrow at higher rates and do other things to, to rebuild an economic base. I mean, you know, it, it's very important that we as a country maintain our economic viability. And this is to me a, a very inexpensive way of doing it. I wanna to get to this question too, because I think that Robert and Lou are good for answering this about um, if a sole proprietor with no other employees can apply for an EIDL loan. Mm -hmm. well, they, 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 could, they could when it was available. I'm sorry, the, the grant, but the loans are, Robert, the loans are still available, correct? But they've, they've, they've tightened up They've tightened up the requirements with respect to them is what I read um, with respect to the new EIDLs. There are additional, you know, you have to have a specific uh, drop in revenue over a period of time. Um, it really, you know, it, it, I'm gonna change courses here. You know, the, the PPP loans are still available for sole proprietors. The most that they can get is $20,833, but still it might, you know, that's a sole proprietor without employees. Um, but it's, it might be a better way for them to go. You can, you can get them both. It, my, my guidance would be, I, I don't know what situation, if you've, not, if you've not applied for EIDL yet, I would apply for an EIDL as soon as you get off this call. Take your time, because if you make a mistake with something like your social or your uh, account number, it's, it's going to come back and haunt you. Uh, you can always turn it down, but at least if it's in the mill, sort of spinning around, you got a shot at getting it. Money will run out. You can apply up to the end of this year for the EIDL, but when the money's gone, it, it, it might be June when the money's gone and, and you're out. So apply now if you haven't already. And as well as the PPP, it does right now, as the law is written, you have until March 31st of 2021 to apply for your PPP. I would recommend you get your documents in order and submit. If you think it's gonna help your business thrive. You can always say, I don't want it. Now, question, with the March 31st deadline, have any loans been approved? And what happens if your bank doesn't provide an application process in a timely fashion? That was a problem with the first round, too. The, the program hasn't yet opened. Uh, we anticipate starting to see it open um, with priority given to some of the smallest lenders. Uh, my sense is, based on some rumors and some facts, uh, next week, uh, and then shortly thereafter, probably a wider opening, but you should absolutely check with your lender to see if they're participating, because they may not be, they may be. Um, there's also, I, I started to say prior, 
There's some smaller community banks that were the real heroes in round one. They took on the orphans, you know, those borrowers that didn't have an existing banking relationship. Uh, and I would encourage dialogue with them. Uh, you know, their 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 charter is to uh, support the local community, so it um, it aligns very well with that. And then there's a bunch of online um, fintechs that you know entered into the equation because uh, their business model needed to pivot, <laughs> so they uh, you know took advantage and became PPP lenders. And there's quite a few of them that have done a tremendous job as well. So. You know, if you're one of those smaller borrowers and you don't have a great um, commercial banking relationship, um, you know, check with the one you have first, but look to your community banks and the fintech world for a, for a solution. Yeah, I have some great small lenders that I've had my clients use that have had great success if anyone wants a recommendation. So we have just a few minutes left. Yeah, and there's a lot to talk about. I know that there is. We just have a few minutes left, so I really want to go around and have everyone give really their, their final thoughts or any pieces of takeaway advice. And like I said, at the very end, I'm going to show a slide with a phone number and an email address for the Groxy CPAs. So if anyone needs help or guidance, you can turn to them and also the website for the SBA. So, And I'll share everyone's contact information also on our social media. So please stay tuned to that. But for now, let's do some final thoughts and takeaways. And let's begin with Rob from the SBA. I'll keep it brief, I promise. So there's an old proverb, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. For the people on this panel, check them out, get some help. Uh, go to the resource partners from the SBA, SBDC, SCORE, Women's Business Centers. If, you, if it's too much to, ta to tackle right now, get some help, just make a phone call or email. Thank you. Jessica? I just want to encourage small business owners to take advantage of these loans, um, especially now because the guidelines are so much more clear than they were before and forgiveness has been going fairly smoothly. If you follow the guidelines provided, these will be forgiven and you will have helped your employees and helped your business grow. And if you have any questions or want to bounce anything off me, I'm available. I love small business and I want to help as much as I can. Thank you. Lou? We we'll just mirror, you know, um, talk to your advisors, whoever they are. And I, I threw out the joke, whether it's your mother-in-law or I, I really meant, meant that, you, you know, there's a lot going on. I, I think every business is functioning in crisis mode, um, whether for, for better or for worse. Some businesses have thrived in this environment. Uh, some have not. Either way, you're in crisis mode and uh, you really should be talking to your advisory group, whoever that is. And Robert? Well, Ronald Reagan once said, you know, snarkily that, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. It's, you know, it, it, it's not true. Well, that's not the case this time. Uh, the government is here to help you. It's here to help you with guys like Rob P that will answer your questions about what the SBA could do to you. It's, it's giving good businesses a grant to keep them alive so they can survive and thrive when this pandemic is, is eventually over. Take advantage of these programs for goodness sakes. They, you know, the, the, the only cost you may incur is that is help filling out the, the, the forms to get them and help filling out the applications. This is free money, go for it. Awesome. Thank you to our whole panel. And I'm gonna share my screen here with this concluding slide, which has our website, the liherald.com slash inside ally, where you can see a recording of this episode and all of our other episodes. And the hotline, the Grazi Crisis Response and Recovery Hotline, there's a phone number there and an email address there for the folks at Grazi if you have any questions for them. And also on our social media, we'll be sharing the resource page for the SBA and Jessica's contact information as well. So thank you to our audience. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you everyone for joining us. Happy and healthy new year. And we'll see you next time on Herald Inside LI with Herald Community Newspaper Group. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.